Father. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity of studying that truth. Be with us this day. We ask it in the precious name of Yahshua, Jesus the Christ, thy Son and our Savior. Amen. If I were to title this lecture, this discussion, perhaps it would be Departed. And it would have reference to the priest of Israel. For truly they have departed from the way of God. It is not a new thing. It is well recorded. It began many years ago and Jesus Christ taught of this departure even as he walked to the earth. God himself in the minor prophet Malachi spoke to the priest. Priest began to let the Nethanim, which in the, is a Hebrew tongue, means those that are given to serve the altar, the obligations of being the scribes for themselves, and it was the Nethanim naturally that turned the truth away from God. So certainly it is a blessing when God has given you eyes to see and ears to hear in relation to this. This is going to be rather simple today. Let's see what God had to say to the priest. Malachi chapter 2, verse 1. And now, O ye priest, uh, this commandment is for you. Now, is this a suggestion? No, it's a commandment, uh, an order. If ye will not hear, and if you will not lay it to heart, to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you. And I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already. It's already done. Because ye do not lay it to heart. Because in the Hebrew it says a little more than this. It says because you haven't taught the things that are important to me. That's what the Father said. Now, then it's well that you would say, well, what is it that's important to God then? What have the priests uh, departed from? Verse 3. Behold, I will corrupt your seed. This is your children, your people. I'm going to corrupt them down through the years. Beloved, look around you today. This generation would have to apologize to those things that happened in Sodom and Gomorrah, whether it be through the, uh, the media of uh, communication, television, whatever, the cities. It's there. Behold, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your faces. Even the dung of your solemn feast, that's the smoke from these sick animals you bring me, I'll let it smear all over your face. Have you ever been in the smoke of these busy, busy cities? Now, that's not what this is referring to, but pollution. And one shall take you away with it. Uh, so you see, they broke um, God's ordinances. Uh, they wouldn't hold to them. You know why? It was real easy. You know, the Nephinim was first brought into the temple to carry wood for the fire of sacrifice. It wasn't long till those lazy Levites had them doing the priest work even. We'll document that before we finish this chapter. Four. And you shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you, that my covenant uh, might be with Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. In other words, God made a covenant with Levi that he would be the priesthood or would carry the priesthood. When he makes a covenant, he intends to see that it sticks. Now, we know, of course, that through um, Melchizedek, the priest of Melchizedek, Christ himself, the king of the just is what Melchizedek means in the Hebrew tongue, that he would see. You might say, well, how, can he, how, how was Christ through the order of Levi. Elizabeth, Mary's cousin, was of, they were of the daughters of Aaron, which was a Levi, of Levi. Therefore, who was Christ's father? Joseph was by adoption from Judah, of course. But God was his father. So this Levitical priesthood continued on, yes, even through Melchizedek. Uh, verse 5, My covenant was with him of life and peace, and I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me. In Hebrew, this, the reverence is better translated. And was afraid before my name. He revered me tremendously. I loved him for this. The law of truth was in his mouth. And inequity was not found in his lips. Uh, he walked with me in peace and equity and did, not, and did turn many 
away from inequity. Beloved, that is a priest's duty. That is chore, is to turn the people away from sin, is to turn them to the truth. Because you see, basically, we're all sinners, and we're all going to sin. You're not supposed, you're supposed to do your very best, and through thank God for grace, though, we are forgiven those that we commit in falling short of the Word of God. But it is the priest that is supposed to carry the truth up the truth forward, especially that order after Melchizedek. Verse 7, For the priest's lips should keep knowledge. How do you get knowledge? Where does wisdom come from? God. So you get knowledge from His Word, not from man. You know, many people say, Well, I'll go over here and see what Brother So-and-so says about this. And after they hear that, Well, I better go get Brother So-and-so's opinion. Go to the Word of God. Get God's opinion. And then you'll have the straight truth. But as long as you mamby-pamby around like a reed shaking in the wind, seeing what this man or that man says without checking the Word of God, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. It is well to fellowship uh, and to study, but make sure that your textbook is the Word of God and not the words of man, for the lips of the priest should have knowledge. And they should seek the law at his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. That's what he's supposed to be. But unfortunately on uh, television anymore and many other mean, uh, uh, minimum uh, methods of communicating the Word of God, we hear super preachers teach, oh, just believe, it'll be all right. You don't have to study the Word of God. Just listen to me and believe. Take everything at face value and you're going to fly by and by to pie in the sky. That's not what God's Word says. So if you want to believe them, have at it. It's your choice. It's a free world. And you have freedom of choice. Okay, verse 8. But ye are departed. Now, if I were going to title this, I would title it, Departed Priest. Out of the way. What is the way? Christ is the way. Ye have caused many to stumble at the law, and you have corrupted the covenant of Levi saith the Lord of hosts. You haven't held to the truth. You let these nethonyms slip in and do your work for you because you're lazy. And beloved, that tradition carries over today because people are too lazy to study the Word of God. Oh, I would have watched something on television. I'll, just, I'll study a little while after this. No, I want to go fishing today. Well, I'm, no, I'm just too busy. Study God's Word. You'll prosper you till you'll have plenty of time to go fishing. But I'm going to tell you something. It's getting a little late in the season if you have not God's truth, especially if you set yourself up as a priest or a teacher. You better be knowing what God would have you teach the people. You're supposed to be a messenger. Do you know that's what angel is in the Word of God? And I'm not saying that any of you is a bunch of angels. I know you. But that's what the word messenger comes from. Okay, verse 9. Therefore have I also made you contemptible and base. That's small before all the people according as you have not kept my ways, that's the ways of the Lord, but have put, have been partial in the law. In other words, you only buddy up to those that give the biggest donations to the church and this, that, and the other. You, you priests just take the easy way out. Now let me tell you something. In Ezra chapter 8, verse about 15, when Ezra was bringing the tribe of the, the children from captivity and returning to Jerusalem, they got a little ways away, and he started checking. I better see how many Levites I have with me. Do you know how many he found? Not one. Had a bunch of Nethanim, though, that were going to go along and do the work. Now, beloved, that's what Jesus warned you about. Again, Nethanim comes from the base word Nathan, which means to give. They were given to do work in the temple. And you can see those little old king knights all the way through saying, Brother Levi, it's all right. Let me do it for you. Of course, old Levi didn't want to jump right up with that little fella pushed right in ahead of him. He said, I'll handle it. I'll get this done for you. Until they took over, Levi grew lazy. And as I said, your documentation on that is in the 8th chapter of Ezra, verse 15. They had, but, but the thing you want to be real careful of, did he send a, someone from the tribe of Benjamin to get some Levites back? Did he send someone from the tribe of Judah? No. Do you know who he sent after the Levites? The Nethanim. You pick them. 
Let a foreigner pick them, a heathen. You might say, well, what difference would it make? Well, beloved, let's just stop and think a moment. Let's just take time out and think just a moment. Earlier this year, there was a, a stir come in all the national newspapers. They were printing an article that said Christ was married to Mary Magdalene and had children by her. We've got documented proof. We found it right here in the scrolls. We've sent 40 theologians. Did it say 40 Christians? 40 theologians over. Do you know what the little... Do you know what the little scroll said, beloved? It said that Mary Magdalena was espoused to Christ. I have one question for you. You see why you can't let anyone but a Christian do your translating for you? A heathen doesn't know what that means because it says Mary Magdalena was married to Christ. That's what it says. Are you? You see, as a Christian, it makes a big difference. Yes, we're all wed to Christ, or you'd better take place in that, uh, that wedding. It better take place. Every Christian is espoused to Christ. You be careful of letting someone else do your translating for you. And let me tell you something. The King James is a good work. But you'd better have a strong concordance so that you know where words were changed that will put you in touch with the Hebrew and Greek that will bring you the truth. Uh, Okay, let's, uh, let's get back to the Word then. So here, here, no wonder God was this unhappy with the priest. Verse 10. Have we not all one Father? Hath not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother by profaning the covenant of our fathers? That is the promises made to Abraham. You'd better know them. You know, many people say, well, that, all, that only because God belongs to those people over there now that call themselves Israelites. Let me tell you something. Jesus said, beware of those who claim to be Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Judah, even if part of them were Judah, Judah is only one tribe. The ten tribes of Israel went north, including Levi. Of course, Levi was with all the tribes. They settled. They disappeared from the Holy Land, so-called, and appeared in England, Great Britain, Europe, Spain, many places, later America. You are a part of those people, beloved. That holds to you as well. You'd better know the truth. You'd better know how God's Word applies to you. You'd better know what Abraham, the covenant that was made with him, and what you are to do today. Just believe in and saying, when the Savior comes, I'm going to follow him. I don't need to study God's Word. Then do you know that a false Christ is going to appear first? If you haven't studied God's Word, then how are you going to know which Christ you're going to worship? How are you going to know which Christ is going to save you? For you see, Christianity shall become the stumbling block. Their own Christianity, where they've been lazy and listen to man rather than studying the Word of God to let them fall in the pit. They've departed uh, from the truth. Uh, let's continue on with verse 11. Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel. In other words, both tribes, the ten tribes gone north, and Judah himself in Jerusalem have brought about an abomination. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange God. And, beloved, if you don't know what that strange God is, you'd better learn who she is today. She is the foundation of that great harlot, that harlot that does not wait for the true Christ, but is already, if you would, crying, I'm not a widow, I'm a queen. And a wedding will be performed to the false Christ when he appears. That's why Jesus said, Woe to you that are a child when I return. How do you spiritually get with child if your husband is away? You've been messing around. You even had a child by him. You've been impregnated in your mind with lies. Christian, wake up. Uh, listen. Think. Verse 12, The Lord will cut off the man that doeth this. The master and the scholar... Out of the tabernacles of Jacob and him that offereth 
an offering unto the Lord of hosts. Let me tell you something. Have you ever turned on a television and listened to one of these so-called super preachers go on for an hour on and on and on, words, words, words? Does he say anything? Does he bring you truth from the Word of God, or is he telling you what his wife did yesterday? Oh, let, let's, let's get her to sing first, you know. Except, this is my family, and this is my boys, and this is my son, and here and here and here and here, and 30 minutes go by, and he reads one verse and then talks about it. He wants you to know about himself then. Then you've got to use the other 25 minutes to raise money. See, some way or another, God's Word just seems to get to pass by. Now, I'm not judging them. Thank God for them. I'm just saying God needs scholars in these end times to know the Word to lead the people. And he's calling them out. I don't know why he chose you to hear, to know the truth, but you have a destiny and a purpose to your people. And you're going to fulfill it in these final years. 13. And this have you done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering any more, or receiveth it with good will at your hand. Oh, they get that mourner's bench up there and they fill it with tears. It's a witch Christ. All oh, they're well and meaning. They teach Jesus. But they don't even know that there is a false Jesus. They don't know that there's a false Savior. And God's going to give the Christian over to them if they haven't educated themselves, not from men, but from this Word. What is the Word? The Word is God. Is truth. 14. Yet you say, Wherefore? Or in modern English, it should be, Why? Well, Lord, why? Because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dwelt treacherously, yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. In other words, who are you traveling with? Do you know? You see, most Israel don't know who they are, number one. And 90% of them don't know whose wife they are. They're going to be joined and say, I'm not a widow. I'm a queen. I'm so married. And he's standing over in Jerusalem before God's chosen people, not being aware of the key night that stands in Jerusalem today. He returned to Jerusalem. Paul made it ever so clear in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that don't you misunderstand. If you... If anything he ever taught, there's one thing he didn't want you to misunderstand. And that was that before Christ returned, before you'd fly away, like so many take from his first letter, 1 Thessalonians, that that was not going to happen until the son of perdition, that Apalia in the Greek, which is one of Satan's names, appears in Jerusalem claiming to be God and showing, that means visibly in front of the people, that he is God. And I'm going to tell you what, many Christians that are waiting for some high-powered rapture are going to think he's Christ come to rapture them. Paul made that so clear that anyone should be able to understand it. Verse 15, And did not he make one? <clears throat> Yet had he the residue of the Spirit? And wherefore one? Why one? That he might seek a godly seed. That's what he wanted. Therefore, take heed to your spirit. Did it say to your body? Make sure your old tummy's full and you're looking good. And, no, it said your spirit, uh, your spiritual body. And let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. You protect Israel. You learn who she is, where she is, and what laws pertain to her. For the Lord, thy, the God of Israel, saith that, uh, that he hateth putting away. That's divorce, of course, but that's the party. For one covereth violence with his garment, and saith the Lord of hosts, saith the Lord of hosts, therefore take heed to your spirit, again your spirit, that you deal not treacherously, that you don't divorce Israel. You find out that you are a part of her. You have worried the Lord with your words. Words, words, words. Yet he saith, Wherein hath we yet ye saith? Wherein hath we wearied him? How have we made God unhappy? We go to church every Sunday and listen to that preacher up there that nobody can really understand what he's saying, but we go all the time. Oh, my. And when you say, 
everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them. Or where is the God of judgment? Beloved, let me tell you something. Throughout this nation, a special program yesterday afternoon, the Christian people of this nation, many high-powered super preachers gathered together to praise the children of Satan standing in Jerusalem. Do you think that made God happy? Calling that right, that it is wrong, the very abomination spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place where it ought not, they were praising God for it. It is no wonder that they weary your father. He loves his children, but it's no different than one of your mates running around with another person. How would you feel about it? Uh, do you think he's happy and rejoicing? No, he's jealous. Uh, and he expects Israel to know their father, their husband. He doesn't like a divorce. It's no wonder he divorced her. Yes, God's divorced. But he's going to take her back. Let's just, let's just do something real simple. Want to? What is it that the priests have left off? The teacher of all teachers. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 13. Let's go to some of the teachings of Christ. Boy, this is difficult, you know. It should, it's real hard to know the truth and teach that there are two seed lines in this Word of God. Well, the Old Testament might say it, but not the New Testament. It's because they didn't understand the teachings of Christ. Matthew chapter 13, verse 10. And the disciples came, and they said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He had told them the, the, the parable of the sowing, and how where the grains fell, and so forth. And he answered, and he said unto them, This is his reason. This is why he talks in riddles. Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. In other words, it's not meant that they should understand. They couldn't handle it. It is no wonder the priests have drifted. Twelve. For whosoever hath, for whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and to, and he shall have more abundance, uh, more knowledge. I'm going to give, you that have a little truth. I'm going to give you a bunch. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that that he hath. When the Antichrist comes to reap the seed, even that little bit of truth will be taken away. Thirteen, therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. Is this supposed to be? Verse 14, and in them is fulfilled the prophecy of the Isaiah which saith, By hearing you shall hear, and shall not understand, and by seeing you shall see, and shall not perceive. In other words, it is written that they are not to understand. You can count on God's Word. It shall happen exactly that way. You might say, well, now, wait a minute. You told us, you told us that you were going to take us and show us that you could prove by Christ's teaching that there was two seed lines. Well, I'm going to. But I want you to know first, Christ does speak in parables, all right? so that some people couldn't understand what he was talking about so they would remain innocent. In other words, their ignorance would be their cloak of innocence eh, till millennium. Skip on down with me, if you would, to uh, verse 24. Let's just pick up here. Let's take the planting of the seed, the dual seed line. We're talking about people. We're not talking about making a hay crop. All right? 24, another parable. Now, this is so you know we're talking in a parable. Put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. Now, most of you know the basic principles of farming. A man went out, he got the old field worked up, and he sowed some seed, all right? But while men slept, his enemy came, and he sowed tares among the wheat, and he went his way. This word tares in the Greek is the wan. It's a, it's a, it's a little weed uh, that grows in this particular area, of Jer in the area of Jerusalem. It looks exactly like wheat. When they're growing together, you would have to be an expert in horticulture to tell them apart. But, oh my, when they mature, the wheat is a rich golden grain, and the seed from the tares or the zawan is black, bitter, and poison. In other words, a man planted good seed, and some enemy come along and spread some poison in the patch. Okay? Verse 26. And when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. In other words, when you could see those whole black seeds showing up out there, you could tell. Hanky-panky going on. 27, so the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, 
didst not thou sow good seeds in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? Lord, look at all the people in this world. Basically good people, but what are these Kenites doing out in here? Okay, I got a little ahead of you, didn't I? What, what, what are all these other seeds doing mixed up in between here? All right, let's find out from him. I won't, I won't spill it before we get there. 28. He said unto them, An enemy. Who said this? God said it. An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? You want us to get an old hoe and go out there and we'll chop them little rascals right out of there. We'll just dig them out by the roots, okay? 29. He said, Nope. At least while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Now, if you've ever hoed in a heavy weeded garden, you know exactly what he's talking about. It's difficult to get all the weeds without chopping down a little okra here and there, right? Okay? He said, you leave them alone. Verse 30. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, this this the reapers, gather ye together first the tares. First you get them old black seeds out of there, poison, bitter. Bind them in bundles to burn them and gather the wheat into my barn. I want that. I want to keep it. I want it in my place of keeping. Now, that's a parable. And we say, well, we got your word for it. The word says they're talking about seed, and here you're saying it's children. Yes, I am. You know why? Because Christ says it, just following that. He talks about a mystery that was hidden by the foundations of this world before God's elect were chosen, or at the time God's elect were chosen, to do this harvest or assist in it, to prepare that end time time. Skip with me to verse 34. Let's pick it up there. All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them. In other words, that's why the multitudes were wrong. They only hear in parable if the remnant, the elect, the true followers of Christ that hear the truth, that it might be fulfilled, again, written, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter, this is the 78th Psalm, if you want to make a note there, things which have uh, been kept um, secret from the foundation of the world. This, this, uh, I, I want to just insert one thing uh, here. This word uh, foundation is not really foundation in the Greek. It's before the kabo, the overthrow of the world that was. All right? Satan's rebellion just after that. 36. And then Jesus sent the multitude away, and he went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. Now, I want you to know this. Not, it, it's all right to ask, Are you sure? that that's talking about wheat. Because you see, even here, the disciples are saying, Lord, explain in detail what you meant there. Now, beloved, I want you to make a mental note. What Christ is about to answer is not a parable. He is explaining a parable. So don't you try to read something into it that isn't. He is clarifying a parable. Let's see if we understand what he was talking about. Verse 37, and he answered and he said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. That's, that's the Ruach, the Spirit that moved upon the waters of the world. Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, uh, from God's command. In other words, God did it. The field is the world. Now, where, where's this field at? It was this terra firma, erects in Hebrew, this world. Isn't that difficult? Hard to follow, isn't it? All right? Now, let's get it straight. The good seed are the children. Oh, it did, it's not wheat, is it? It's really, it's children. C-H-I-L-D-R-E-N. Children. Of the kingdom. It's God's children. We're talking about one seed line there. But the tares, uh-oh, uh-oh, I thought everybody was a child of God. Well, that's not what Christ is teaching here, and he's not speaking in a, in a parable. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. Now, does that say tares again? No, it says Again, no, it says children. It's as bad as some people say an Eve eat an apple. The word apple's not in the Bible there in that particular chapter. You better know what happened in the garden. Satan sowed his own seed. And Cain was the offspring thereof. That's what it's talking about. 
I, Oral Murray said that. No, that's what this word says. Can you read that? It's not a parable. We're talking about two different sets of children. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. Oh, it's a great mystery then, isn't it, who the father of this enemy and bad seed is? No, it's the devil. There's no mystery in it. He's explaining the mystery. The harvest is the end of the world. That's what... That's what he was talking about, harvest. When the end of this age comes, and the reapers are the angels that shall come with him when he returns to this earth as king of kings and lord of lords, verse 40, and therefore the terrors are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of this world. Many might say, well, you mean when Christ returns? No, beloved, at the end of this world age. This world is not changed one iota. I'm speaking terra firma until the end of the millennium. It is Revelation 21 at the beginning of the eternity that this earth has changed. And it is at that time the lake of fire shall be provided for those that still wish to be tares. But through the millennium, beloved, you, God's elect, will have an opportunity to teach even these. Revelation chapter 3, verse 9, faith. Those that claim to be Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan, will come and worship at your feet. Because they hate you, no, but because you'll be teaching the truth and you're standing at the feet of Christ. It's Christ that they're worshiping. The priests have departed from the simplicity of the teachings of Christ. They have made it so complicated uh, that people cannot understand a simple statement like this, and yet it is fulfillment of prophecy within itself which fulfills the miracle. It is written that they cannot hear. They are blinded by God. Romans chapter 11 states, I send them the spirit of stupor. It says, uh, it says slumber in English, but uh, it's stupor in the Greek, which means a daze, awake, but in a daze. Turn back with me in closing to chapter 7 of Matthew. There is a time coming soon. What difference does it make then how far the priests are? All you have to do is believe and teach Jesus. Uh, drive out demons in His name. No, it makes a big difference because it's according to which Jesus you're referring to because that same wicked one that sowed the seed is returning to this earth as a Savior very soon. And you better have learned from the simplicity of the teachings of Christ that many shall be deceived. Uh, chapter 7, verse 21 of the same book of Matthew in closing. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. No, he told us the parable of the king entering the kingdom of heaven. We just read it, one of them. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. How are you going to do God's will? By what some preacher tells you? You're treading on dangerous ground. If you do, you better get God's will from his own mouth, his word, his plan. Study God's word. Many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Lord, I prophesied day and night dreams and visions. I know what you're saying, Lord. And in thy name I've cast out devils. And in thy name have done many, many wonderful, wonderful works. I mean good, Lord, right from my heart. I'm glad you're here. And then shall I profess unto them, I knew, never knew you. I didn't say it. You only claim I said it. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity, you bunch of sinners, fakes. You see, they were worshiping the false Christ and a bunch of pretenders along with them. Let me tell you, you might say, well, that's awful hard for the Lord to do that. Well, how would, uh, he's the husband, how would you feel if your mate uh, had married someone else and had a child by him and come back and just wanted you to, with open arms, take him right back in? Now, I, you see what I mean. It's not a pleasant thing. So you can bet the Lord's not going to be happy when he returns and finds his bride happily married, but not happy for long when he tells them, um, depart from me ye that work iniquity. So that's why I would call this depart. The priests have departed from the truth and consequently the people will be told to depart all fall. Does it mean they're going to hell? No, he didn't say that. It means that they're not going to be the first fruits at the beginning of the millennium. It means they've still got to be taught. You better believe there are two seed lines and you better believe there are two Christs. For the true Christ will say to more 
that is the multitude that worships the Antichrist soon, thinking he's come to rapture them away, there will be more here, that statement. Get away from me! Depart from me! For it is written in the 44th chapter of Ezekiel concerning the millennium that only the Levitical priesthood, that is to say the Zadok, which is the just, that means the ones that have the truth, the elect of God, can enter into Christ until the end of the millennium. Beloved, this is wonderful times we're living in. But you need God's truth. You need to study the Word of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. Humbly, Father, we come before thee seeking knowledge. Father, let thy students in these last days have that knowledge. We know, Father, that knowledge comes not from man, but all wisdom comes from you, and in using common sense, man is able to ascertain knowledge. Father, bless us. Father, as a decision is being made, I know, in thy kingdom this day. Let us have the answer tomorrow, Father. Thy will be done. We want no more. We want no less. Thy heavenly plan and its perfection. Show us how to serve thee. We ask it in the precious name of Yahshua, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Good evening to you. God bless you and welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. It's always good to gather in our Father in Yahweh's name. His truth is marching on. His truth is the most beautiful thing in the world. It is the way. It is the peace of life. It is the comfort that is afforded us in these final days. What we have to do is take hold of Him, learn His truth, and His truth that you free. Let us approach His throne in prayer. Yahweh, dear Heavenly Father, Father, creator of this universe, we thank thee, Father, for the written word, Father. We thank you, Father, for the manuscripts. We thank you, Father, for the truth. Be with us this evening. We ask it in the precious name of Yeshua, Jesus the Christ, thy Son, and our perfect Savior. Amen. This will be on the reverse of depart from me, I know ye not. That is, that Yahshua will be speaking to those that claim to know a Messiah who is the false Messiah. I felt this should be a word of comfort, for God's plan is love. God's plan is understanding. But, even in a plan of love, it is not that you are to accept Satan. You are to recognize him for what he is, and what he attempts to do with your people. There is not a time in our lives that we do not hit a point of stress. That's what this is about tonight. Who is Yahweh? Who is our Father? What is He like? Does He cry? Does He love? Yes, He does. There's only one thing He wants from you, and that is for you to love Him. Don't forget daily to tell him that you do love him, that you want to serve him. He loves all of his children. He observed on that day that closes Genesis chapter 1, and he looked upon all the children. He saw all that he had created. I'm not talking about hybrids, but all that he had created. And it was good. So, as his servants, it is your duty and your obligation to serve him in the way that he would have you serve him. But there comes a time and a place where the flesh is weak, which is most every day. And in the flesh, we sin. And it really kind of rips me off when I hear one of these Christians that say, I want just a little more of the Spirit. And we jump and we romp around. I need more Spirit. That's the way you get the Spirit. Spirit is God and God is. You either have all of Him or you don't have anything. The Spirit works differently on different people. It shows differently 
on different people. But don't ever tell me you want a little more of the Holy Spirit. You either have Him or you don't. It's that clear cut. He doesn't parcel Himself out. God is. Asha Ia. So, know that when you have Him in you, you need nothing else. Many will say, well, I have this gift or I have that gift. There is only one gift. And that is the gift of having Him. And He teaches you the diverse things that you will do. Man is nothing. The Word, the living Word, is all wisdom. And man in his uh, philosophy can say, I can do it better than him. I don't need God. I can give you a set of circumstances. I can hypnotize you, or I can stretch you out here and we'll go into dynamics, and I'll take you back all the way to the birth even until you take the... Sh you know, really. Flesh is weak, and you can utilize flesh. You can make flesh do most anything. But there is only one Spirit, one Holy Spirit. And that is the Comforter. That is the living God. And when man toys and grows too far away from the Word. It is good to use psychology to think positive. It's another thing to let positive thinking draw you away from righteous thinking. But what is our refuge? What is our full parcel? What is our inheritance? Let's turn to Psalms 91. We're just going to take comfort in this tonight. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Now, don't you ever tell me that God doesn't know you, He doesn't hear your prayers, that uh, He doesn't care about you. You dwell under His shadow. Under the shadow of what? Two, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. Now, beloved, if you ever want to trust in something that will always be there, if you want to use a little power of positive thinking to psych yourself out for it, if that helps, but you won't need it after the true Holy Spirit comes in. And, and please don't think I'm talking against thinking positive. You should think positive, but do not make a religion out of it. God is your refuge. There is no other. This world will eat you up. Many will say, oh, I can hack it. Then tell me why you have those bad nights. I don't need him. I don't need that protection. Tell me, why is it that you take a tranquilizer then now and then or you, your body breaks down on you? You'd better know that you need him. He is the only wisdom in this world. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. That's the tempest in the Hebrew. He will deliver you, if you would, even from the hour of temptation, including the temptor. You know, people do pretty well in the flesh. You can fake many things. But you see, the snare of this fowler is soon when the supernatural beings begin to appear and they're not mentally prepared to deal with that but foremost they are not spiritually prepared to deal with the trap that will soon appear in Iudasa. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under the, his wings shall thou thirst. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. You have on the gospel armor, this is a takeoff from it. Most of the New Testament are figures of speech or sayings or as it is said by the prophet or the disciples, it is written. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night. This is the hunter's trap at night, if you would. Nor for the arrow that flieth by day. Do you know why you're not going to be trapped or deceived? Because you, if you know the key night, if you know the trap that he has set, then you certainly do not have to be afraid of it. In other words, 
if you know the true father and the false father, the true seed, the false seed, you have peace of mind. You don't have to worry about being deceived by a fake so-called deliverer. You know, unfortunately, many people that do not believe in a deliverer, when they do see the supernatural fake deliverer, will become believers overnight. Unfortunately, it'll be too late at that time. Don't be trapped. That's what this is saying. Who keeps you from being trapped? The truth, Yahweh, the Heavenly Father. He protects you. If you're under His wing, you're under His teachings. If you have the seal of God, that means His living truth in your forehead. I heard a minister say the other day, there's a wonderful thing going to happen sometime soon. 144,000 people are going to wake up with the seal of God on their forehead in the morning. It says, in the mind. All right? They're going to know the truth in their mind. There's no numerics in the, either the seal, the mark of the beast, so-called, or the seal of the living God. It is simply His truth. Okay. Um, a thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. You know, this is what throws a lot of Christians off, and they dream of this great blood running down the streets up to the bridles of the horses by not understanding. A thousand will be deceived by your side. One will know the truth. Mainly because your people are not interested in studying the truth. They're not interested in a Maserati text. They're not interested even in a Masera, and most of them don't even know what a Masera is. They're interested in what man has to say. And man knows nothing outside the wisdom of God. That's why when you go to a nation that I mentioned earlier, such as Russia, or on a battlefield where you're fighting a communist nation, and you see those kids, and the way they allow them to be butchered without caring, then you know what true atheism is. Uh, you know how sharp a nation is without God. And until you've been out in a foxhole and have seen some of those children come up bleeding, then don't profess that you know what communism is really about. You may have listened to a little propaganda. Oh, it sounds beautiful. 90% correct. Maybe even 95 I'll give them. It's that 5% that kills. Okay. Verse uh, 8. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. You that have eyes to see, what it's saying here, you will see the wicked receive their reward. Is it not written in Revelations chapter 1 that even those that pierced Christ shall observe him at his return with their eyes, visually? Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. In other words, if you believe in him, you are protected. Now, if you want to believe in man and man's philosophy, his great wisdom, go ahead. Did man create... Where was man when... God created this earth. Oh, man has... You don't understand, though. Man has put vehicles on the moon. God placed the moon there, beloved. You see? Okay. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Beloved, you can believe that. He will protect you even as the Passover happened. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Do you remember that scripture? That was the scripture Satan tried to tempt Christ with. Remember? The 40 days in the wilderness? When Satan told Christ, Don't worry. Didn't God jump off of there? Didn't God say that the angels would protect you? And of course he misquoted this. He said at any moment, more or less, but this is in God's way. They will bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. 
Now, of course, in the Hebrew is where the real truth of this comes forward in that word stone, Tyre, which is the false rock, the king of Tyre, which is the supernatural Ezekiel chapter 28 uh, of Satan's position before the first rebellion. Tyre means rock in Hebrew or stone. Their rock is not our rock. Their God is not our God. See that you're not deceived. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder and the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Um, you know who the dragon is. Many people say, well, what dragon is it talking about? That old serpent, he's a play actor. He goes by many names. That's why in the book of Revelation he is called by many names. That old dragon, the devil, the serpent, meaning that one we were speaking of earlier even in the garden, which is Satan. Okay? All those roads. You will trample him under your feet because you will be at the feet of Christ, which is a, a, a term which means he will. All Christ's enemies shall be put under his rule, his feet. Okay, meaning rule. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. Beloved, if you know the true God's name, if you know, if you would, the true Christ, you're not going to be fooled by the false one. That's important. God hath set aside 7,000 that shall not bow a knee to Baal. Even Elijah was told this. Uh, many Christians will bow to a false Christ in the very near future, for they are expecting a man with red long-handled underwear on, a big pitchfork, and two horns. They have observed this picture from you. The king of Tyre was, was, was most, the most beautiful of the cherubims. God made him so. The deceiver of all deceivers. God said in the Hebrew tongue, I made you the full pattern. That means you'll have everything. The human mind is not quite equipped to handle what's coming. And Paul, for the benefit of those that would say, well, I don't worry about that. When that happens, I'm going to be raptured right out of here. Well, that's not taught in God's Word. That's a teaching of man that only started a short 200 years ago. Paul made it very clear in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He said, I want to talk to you, re I want to talk to you real seriously about a thing that's going to happen. You see, he knew that his first letter had been misinterpreted. He said, I want to talk to you about our gathering back to Jesus Christ. That day shall not come to pass until the son of perdition, Apalia, one of Satan's names, the Antichrist, appears in Jerusalem in the holy place claiming to be God, or that is to say, Yeshua, Messiah. He said, it's just will not come to pass that Yeshua, Jesus the Christ, will return until after this happens. That word in the Greek is apostasy which means a great falling away from a religion, and then it will come to pass as it is written. The chief cornerstone, that is Yahshua, Jesus the Messiah, shall become their stumbling block. In other words, their own Christianity will cause them to be deceived, for they have been taught only one Christ, more or less. And it is sad. But even this, their ignorance is there. They're, in ignorance, there is no sin. And in the millennium, you will be able to teach them. I was mentioning Kenites earlier in that parable of the sower of the tares. It says there that every last tear shall be gathered and burned. But tell me this. If a Kenite becomes the son of God, is he or she a tear? No way. They become a son of God, and they shall not be burned. Because if I did not believe that Yeshua Messiah had the power to save and to bring forth any soul that believed upon him, I would quit today. 
that he is all-powerful in that respect. It is said that there's only one thing that Yahweh cannot do. And as you know, that's why we're here. He cannot make you love Him. Mainly because He won't. You can't buy love. You can't order it. That's fake. That's false. He wants your love that generates from within your entity. That's all He wants. And that's why we fell in the world that was is one-third of his children refused to love him from within freely. And he had a choice. What I'm saying is, as we moan and we groan and we cry about the pain that we suffer in this flesh, but, beloved, we suffer this flesh body that was created at the beginning of this world age to save that one-third of our people. For they were God's children, and he had a choice when Satan rebelled in this role he played as the king of Tyre. He could kill him. But think about killing one of your children. God loves his children. He chose rather to destroy the world it was. Tuhu Vabuhu, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, which does not read in the manuscripts, and the world was void. It says, the world became void and with form after the destruction. That's what Peter was speaking of in Second Peter chapter 3 concerning the three worlds. That one that was, this one, and the one that should be. But he loves you. He is your refuge. I don't care how salty this earth gets. The flesh is weak. You're going to pain. But keep your eyes on him. I don't care what language you speak. Mean in your mind him. Love him. He loves you. That's all he wants. And you know, you've heard me use this before. You've heard me use it many times. You've, I think there's a very striking commercial on television at this time where this little old lady is called. And, well, it's what happened? Did the world fall apart? Did somebody die? No, he just called to say he loved me. So don't don't sit down at night and try to con God. Okay, well, here, I want, you know, I'm going to bring this up and I want to mention this while I'm at it. And then I'll mention this and I'll bring this up. Hey, you can't con him, all right? He knows. But just call him up. You have a direct line. You have the biggest 800 number in the world. Okay. Just call him up and say, Father, I just wanted to call and say, I love you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do love you, Lord. Father, we love your word. Father, we love your creation. And that, Father, let wisdom and knowledge concerning the events that are happening in this world be made known to the people, Father. We know that many are blinded. And, Father, we ask that thy love for them, and through the millennium, that great time of salvation, Father, we long for that time. And we're not to pray to hasten it, Father, but oh, how my, how our hearts yearn, Father, for that new age in that new body where completeness in truth will be found. And when man's mind is released from only five or ten, from ten percent used to full maximum remembrance of what was, Father, we long for that time. In the precious name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen. Amen.